In this tutorial, we will build a slider that shows its value and syncs it to everybody else in the world. I'm starting from the Udon example scene that comes in the VRChat examples folder. This gives us a nice place to start for building any scene. I'm going to delete everything we don't need. So everything from prefabs to get all players, we'll remove that chooser container as well. This leaves us with our basic setup with a world descriptor and a nice floor so we have somewhere to stand. We'll save this as a new scene. All right, we've got our new scene. The first thing we're going to do is actually build out this slider. So sliders go on canvases. Let's choose UI, canvas. By default, this is a screen space canvas, not so good for VR. We want a world space canvas. I'll set it to 512 by 128, just around the shape of a slider, and zero it out. Let's take a look. Wow, that is big. By default, world space canvases are very, very large. I like to take them down to 0 0.005. That's typically a good scale. Now let's take a look. There we are. I'm going to move this canvas up in the scene a little bit. And let's make it visible by adding a UI panel. We'll make this panel opaque. And just for fun, give it a little bit of color. OK, now we can see how it actually looks in the scene here. I'm going to move the canvas itself up a little bit and then towards the camera so it fills our default game view. This will make it easier to follow along as we're building things. We've got our canvas and our panel. I'm going to add a slider to the panel, UI, slider. All right, by default, it's a little small. So let's scale it up. I'm just gonna go times three. Holding control makes it easy to jump to whole numbers there. To get things working for VR chat, we need to add a VRC UI shape onto the canvas. This tells VRChat that the canvas has interactable items. We want to change the layer to the default layer rather than the UI layer, which is what Unity applies by default. So now this will work when we actually build and test in VRChat. When I select this slider, I can change the value at edit time here. I can see that we go from zero to one with floating point numbers in between. Now I want to see these values on the screen in order to better understand and track the value. So we're going to add a text field to this slider. I want to add this text field to the actual handle here. So let's find that element, slider, handle, slide area, handle. We can see that's the actual bit that moves around. I will add a UI text to the handle. It creates it at a default size here, much larger than the handle. Select the Rect tool and we'll get Rect. We'll make this fit just inside. All right, so now that fits inside. But of course, our text is no longer showing. With our text selected, we'll choose Best Fit and allow it to get very small. It's also very blurry. We can fix this by going to our canvas element and choosing five or more dynamic pixels per unit. Let's set a default value for this text that's more like what we'll be getting. Let's say we want 0.0 and we'll center that text. We now have a slider with a text field, but in play mode, we can see that though we can move it, the text is not automatically updating because we haven't told Unity how to actually do that. So we're going to do that now with our first bit of Udon. I'm going to add an Udon behavior on the canvas object. I like to keep my behaviors on root level objects when possible. It makes them easier to find. So we add an Udon behavior here and choose new program. It's going to name this using the game object it's on by default. So I'm going to rename it here to synced slider. That's all updated. 
Now we can open up this graph and start hooking things up. Let's think through what we're trying to do here. When we change the slider value, we want to set the text of the text field to the value of the slider. So we know we're going to need references to the slider and the text field to get and set the values. I'm going to start by selecting the slider game object and dropping its component onto the graph here. That creates a slider variable called slider and adds a way to get the reference to that object. Let's do the same for text. We drag this actual text component in here and drop it. Now, it just calls this text. I think of these as text fields, and we're going to be doing get and set on text properties. So let's rename this just to make that all more clear. Now that's called text field. Let's check on our canvas elements once we compile here. It remembered the reference to the slider, but it forgot about the text field. You see how it says none. This is because we renamed the text field. Easy enough. I can just drop this game object onto there. It's only got one text field component, so it's going to find that and hook it up for us. So now our Udon graph knows about the slider and our text field. We want to get the value of the slider. So I'll drop this and type in value, get the value. And we'll want to set the text value of the field. So I'll type in set text. It's this one. You'll notice we have a green float to a yellow string value here. So these won't connect by default. We'll need to do a little conversion. So I'll just drop the float down and type in string. And we get two options. We're going to use float to string to actually do some number formatting in a minute. But first, we'll see what it looks like just to connect that up. Finally, there's this unused flow port. We need to trigger this all to happen somehow. We want this to happen when the value of the slider changes. Let's select the slider and add an action to on value changed. We want it to change the udon behavior. That's on this object here. We'll select udon behavior, and then you can just press S a couple times until you get to send custom event or pick it with your mouse. Now the slider sends a custom event. We can call this whatever we want. I'm going to call it update label and copy that to my clipboard. In the graph, we'll add custom event and paste in update label as its name. Now connect it to the flow. And whenever the value changes on the slider, it will call the custom event update label, which will then set the text of our field based on the value of the slider we've turned into a string. Let's play it and see what happens. Indeed, we can see zero here, all the way up to one with these tiny little numbers in between. Unity is scaling down the text to fit within the field because we checked best fit. But we can do a little better by changing this method here to string iFormat provider. And we're going to add in a format of F1. So we'll add a string constant and type in F1. You can press the question mark here to learn more about the float to string node and all the ways that you can modify a float. For now, all you need to know is an F1 here will give one decimal place. I'll make sure we've compiled and then run the scene again. Now our slider will neatly go from 0.0 to 1.0, only showing one decimal place. If we wanted to show two, we could change the string constant to F2. Very simple, nice and readable. Now that this is all working to some extent, I'm going to turn it into a group by selecting everything, right click, create group. I'll call it update label from slider. I'm going to take a moment here to rearrange things. I like my noodles not to overlap. I think it makes it more readable. I usually wait until I get things in a group so I can sort of see how it all comes together. There we are, no overlapping, and I can see what's going on more clearly. 
To review, we now have a slider which uses Udon to update its own text field value and show it on the screen. To sync this value to other players, we need a variable of type float, since that's what the slider uses. I'm going to call it slider value and set it to synced. The default value of zero is fine. In order to update this on other players, I need to actually change this variable's value when the slider moves. I can drag the variable in, which would create a get variable node. If I hold control, it'll turn into a set variable node. After we set the text, we want to set the value of the slider value variable to the value we just got from the slider. So now we have a float variable, which is set whenever the slider is changed. I'm just going to move things around a little bit to make that more visible. There we go. Straighten up those lines. Nice. OK, so now since I'm the owner of this object, I update this value. Other players will receive that new value and then on deserialization will fire for them. So let's add on deserialization. If this doesn't sound familiar, please go back and watch the networking concept tutorial where we talk about serialization, deserialization, and how all of that works. When this fires, we have a new slider value. Let's go ahead and get that. And we want to update the value of our own slider based on this synced variable. I drag in a slider reference. We already have one here, but because this flow is completely separate from the existing one, I'm going to make a new reference to keep things neater. We want to set the value of this slider. Add a set value node to the new value of the synced variable when on deserialization is called. That's it. This will now update the slider. Let's see it in action. I'll go to my SDK panel and launch two clients in non-VR, build and test. All right, we've launched two clients here. The one on the right came in first, so they are the owner of the slider. And when they move the slider here, you'll see it actually update on the left. And it already updates the text field, so everything is working as we want it. Now, what happens when the player on the left changes the text field? Well, you can see the slider moves but it keeps returning back to 0.5. That's because they're continuously receiving on deserialization events with a current slider value of 0.5. They move it locally, on deserialization triggers and moves it back to the synced value. Since that's all working now, I'm going to turn this second bit of logic into its own group and call this update slider from synced variable. Looking at the logic, why does the text field update for other players as well? The owner of the slider sets this value, which triggers on deserialization. So other users update their sliders from slider value, which then triggers the slider's on value changed event, which calls the update label event in the Udon behavior, updating their text field. It will also try to set the slider value, but because they're not the owner of the object, this will do nothing. At this point, you're welcome to stop and apply this logic to your own scenes or mess around with this graph. We're going to push ahead into a couple more advanced things. The first one is adding in some logic to actually stop other players from trying to set the slider value. Now this won't do much at the moment, but if you wanted to have separate branches for the owner and non-owners, this is a good place to start that logic. First, I want to branch based on whether the current player is the owner or not. So let's add a branch. And let's add networking is owner. This is owner node will control which branch we take. And instead of setting the slider value right away, I'm going to branch first. And then only set the value from the true end of the branch. So now this bit of logic here will only run for the owner. Let's create a little group out of that called update variable if owner. So far, we've been using the continuous synchronization method. 
which is good for frequently updated variables. But let's swap to the manual method. In this way, we have more control over exactly when the value is actually serialized. With the switch to manual, this will no longer actually work as is. We need to add in a new node, which is request serialization. In this case, we're saying we only want to actually send this value over the network when the slider has changed and we're the owner. We get to leave the instance port blank because just like this game object here, they will default to this, meaning this current object. So this current udon behavior will get serialized. So now let's launch this into clients and see what's different. Here we are with two clients again. This time the one on the left is the owner. I can change the slider and see the slider on the right update. In this case, I feel like the slider on the right is actually updating quicker than it was before. We're sending data only when it changes, and its priority is a bit higher because it's set to manual mode. One difference you'll notice, though, is that when the player on the right, who doesn't own the object, changes their slider, it doesn't actually snap back to the correct value of 0.0. This is because we're only sending the update when it's actually changed on the left. As soon as I change it on the left, it'll update on the right. This is just a little gotcha you have to think about when you're doing manual serialization. One way we can make sure that only the owner is changing the slider is by turning off interactable for anyone who is not the owner. So on start, let's set interactable from is owner. Start, reference to slider, we want to set interactable. And its value will be networking is owner. So for the owner, it's interactable. For everyone else, it's not. Let's also change the color of the slider if it's disabled. So if it's disabled, we're going to turn it red, but keep it opaque. Now let's see if that works. Well, there we are. We can very clearly see that the player on the right is not the owner of the slider. So the one on the left can move the slider around, but if the player on the right tries, they will not be able to move it at all and therefore cannot get out of sync. Since that succeeded, the last thing I'll do is turn this into a group that I will call set slider interactable from is owner. Zooming out to see everything we have. We have tackled quite a lot in this tutorial. Hope this is useful for you and look forward to seeing what you make. <laughs>